race to win wars and explore the stars have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed and we use them every day unaware of their amazing origins on wicked inventions the wristwatch why was world war one instrumental to its popularity today the digital camera what is the link between spy satellites and a selfie the prosthetic leg, the amazing evolution of this high-tech wonder. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. The modern wristwatch has many roles. An expensive piece of jewellery, a high-tech wrist-worn computer, or even a device to tell the time. But did you know that warfare was the reason for its popularity today? Personal watches can trace their origins back to 16th century Europe, with timepieces worn by men as pendants around their neck. Watches were a very expensive item, and the wristwatch was viewed as an exclusively female accessory, typified by Bobbert Dudley, presenting a wristwatch to the English Queen Elizabeth I in 1571. Wristwatches were mainly reserved for women, and were known then as wristlets, uh, and it was certainly very effeminate for a man to wear a wristwatch. It was in World War I, though, that good timekeeping became as important as the bullets in a soldier's gun, or the boots on his feet. You come to the First World War, and you have the famous, the infamous Battle of the Somme, 1st of July 1916. 7.30 in the morning, you've got to know exactly what time you're going over. If you're holding a pocket one, how are you then going to hold your weapon? The only way the soldiers could safely advance towards them was if a creeping barrage of their own artillery screened their advance, like a huge exploding curtain falling just ahead of them. As they moved forward, so did the covering fire, killing the enemy but going over the heads of their own side. That Battle of the Somme, the artillery with their watches, their watches had to tell the same time as the guys in the trenches, as the senior officers back at headquarters, everybody had to be on that same time. It was a necessity, practical necessity. If you could have access to data very quickly, then that's effectively what a wristwatch was. It was access to very important data without fumbling around in pockets, trying to remember which pocket your pocket watch sat in. To protect the glass face from the mud, blood and bullets too, the watches were fitted with shockproof faces and luminous dials developed to give an accurate time check in the dark of a trench where a sniper's bullet would find its target if a light was turned on. With the memory of their practicality in World War I fresh in their minds and the availability of cheap parts and mass production, even the ordinary D-Mob man could now afford one. The wristwatch was here to stay. So the next time you glance at your watch, just think that device sitting on your wrist owes its popularity to the hell of the Western Front. The wristwatch, truly a wicked invention. The Schofield Watch Company has been creating luxury wristwatches since 2011. The life of a Schofield watch starts with the manufacture of the watch case. The watch case is comprised of two parts, the front, which the strap will be fitted to, and the rear, which is a glass window to display the watch mechanism. It takes many man hours to make a mechanical wristwatch, and a mechanical wristwatch especially because there are so many moving parts, there's so much engineering involved. The case alone takes about 14 hours to machine from billet to uh, the finished piece ready for assembly. The front part of the watch case starts off as a large piece of titanium called a billet. The billet undergoes a long and rigorous process called machining where its shape is sculpted using the latest computer numerical control machinery. Also known as CNC machines, these mills and lathes can cut with absolute precision to achieve a perfect finish. Even using state-of-the-art machinery, this shaping process still lasts for eight hours. To begin, the billet is fixed to a lathe where the first cuts and initial holes are made. 
Once completed, the billet is then taken through the first of many mill processes. Here, the inner threads are bored out, cleaned and examined by hand. Then it is back to the mill, where the front, top and back of the newly formed casing is carved out. It is here that we can start to see the watch casing take shape. A stainless steel back is fitted, then it is back to the mill once again for fine tuning. Quality control, tolerances, engineering prowess and skill, experience of watchmakers, all of these things are, are extremely important in making something that is durable and will be used uh, every day for effectively 20 years. And this means that you have to pay incredible attention to quality control and the materials in which you use to make your watches with. The casing is put through its final machining process before it is sent to be inspected by hand. Each case must pass through an inspection before it is released to the assembly labs. Once the case has passed inspection, it is sent to the assembly lab where skilled watchmakers begin a detailed and meticulous routine to hand build the watches. The first stage is to use a machine called a crystal press. It is used to press the glass into the case to create a tight friction fit and to help keep the watch waterproof. The maker then carefully selects the movement parts by hand from a range of old and new stock that has been fully refurbished. The watch is comprised of an extremely complicated set of parts and it can take up to three hours for a skilled watchmaker to carefully and precisely place all the movements, auto works and rotors together. Then it comes to actual watch assembly and the building of the movements. Uh, and again, looking at the beta, we use new old stock Swiss movements and these have to be serviced so effectively they're stripped down to their component parts. Uh, then they are rebuilt. So we're looking at a further three hours to put that together by a watchmaker. So we really are accumulating a lot of man hours to be able to put uh, a wristwatch together. The dial is then added along with the hands before testing at key points to make sure all the mechanisms are aligned correctly. The movement is then placed inside the casing and fastened into place to make sure the fit is tight and waterproof. The completed watch is then put through a pressure and vacuum machine to test the tolerance levels of the watch and to make sure it meets Schofield's high standards. Every watch that leaves the factory is meticulously inspected, with final inspections carried out by hand before being packaged into a handcraft box ready for delivery. The Schofield watch, a functional item that is truly a miniature engineering masterpiece. love the quick family snap, the photo of an amazing experience and even the mundane shot of what you ate last night. But have you ever considered the technology that has made photography so easy and instant? And what has a selfie got in common with spy satellites? The digital camera, that's what. Digital photography, digital video is all around us and people use it now everywhere, all of the time, in a way that we really didn't see um, before and it has really changed the way people go about their daily business. Digital photography allows people to share pictures and images in a way that they just couldn't do before. If you are under the age of 20, you cannot possibly imagine how this technology has changed the way we take and share a picture. In the years BC, also known as before cameras, the only way to create an image was to whip out an easel and paint away. The invention of the film camera changed all that with their introduction to the mass market in the 1900s. Now, Nifty Science had given everyone the ability to capture that special moment in time. In a traditional film camera, the light comes in, is, is captured to a small opening, then projected uh, to mirrors and lenses onto a film surface, which is coated with a substance that has light-sensitive uh, material in it. So it had to be developed before you could share it. There was no easy way of then transmitting it uh, in almost real time to somebody else. With the popularity of film cameras firmly established, what was the need for digital photography? For this answer, we need to look to the stars. 
the successful launch of the Sputnik satellite by the Russians in October 1957 opened up a new frontier in intelligence gathering. Soon, US and Russian spy satellites equipped with film cameras were being launched to keep an eye on each other from the lofty perch of space. In the early days of spy satellites, they used actual cameras with film on board the satellite. So now you have this problem of the satellite that sits in orbit around the Earth can't easily be brought back down to Earth. So you need to get the film down. And therefore, all kind of elaborate schemes whereby the film went into a re-entry capsule that was then uh, shot back down, it came down on a parachute, a plane came by and picked it up with a grappler hook. Uh, this creates all kinds of practical and, and other difficulties. This complicated system needed to be improved, and the launch of the $1 billion 15-ton KH-11, or Keyhole-class satellite in 1976, solved this issue with its amazing digital camera, powered by a revolutionary CCD or charge-coupled device. A charge-coupled device, it's a surface that has a property that when light falls onto it, it generates a, an electrical charge that is, that is proportional to the light that falls onto the surface. So basically, an image, a visual image, is translated into a series of electrical charges. Those electrical charges can then be taken into an electrical signal that can be transmitted to a receiver and when that signal can be retranslated into visual points of light on a screen or, uh, or any other form of imaging. The 800 by 800 pixel CCD used on board the KH-11 provided a resolution of 640,000 pixels. This meant the US government could focus on an object as small as 5 inches from 200 miles away in space and beam an electronic version of the image back to Earth instantly. So. The military proved this CCD's worth, but when CCD-equipped digital cameras hit the shops in the 1990s, their high cost led to slow sales. Enter the complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, or CMOS sensor. Developed and refined during the late 1990s, the CMOS sensor captures an image in a similar way to the CCD, but is made using traditional microchip manufacturing techniques, unlike the specialised and expensive CCD. CMOS requires less power than traditional CCDs, so it is quite suitable for devices like mobile phones where battery power comes at a premium. And furthermore, this technology is very similar to other components already used in uh, cameras, and therefore it makes for a, a convenient and uh, economically feasible way of producing uh, cameras uh, for things like mobile phones that are compact, don't require a lot of power, yet still have uh, good quality uh, imaging uh, properties. With these clever sensors powering the cameras inside our phones, the digital camera is now part of our everyday lives and has given us the ability to capture and share our experiences as never before. A device invented for spying, but now used for the obligatory selfie. The digital camera, truly a wicked invention. now familiar with the digital camera in our mobile phones capturing every detail of our lives. But what about focusing even closer on our world? Let's make our mobile phone into a mobile microscope. We will need plexiglass, wood, bolts, washers, a small LED flashlight and a laser pointer. Notice the tiny lens at the front of your phone? Well, the secret is to change its focal plane. That is the distance from the camera the objects are in focus, by putting another lens in front of it. Enter the laser pointer. To point with the laser pointer, you need to concentrate the laser light to, well, a point. At the front of the pointer is a tiny lens, which concentrates light far greater than our phone's camera. We carefully pop the lens out of the pointer, and by fixing it in front of our phone's lens, we have created a powerful microscope. Well, not quite. This setup will let us zoom into an object over a hundred times, but at this magnification, holding the camera by hand is going to be a little too shaky. Enter the wooden bolts. Our tester creates a stand by drilling three holes in a square piece of wood. Three bolts are added with nuts and washers screwed on to keep them in place. A small sheet of plexiglass has two holes made to allow it to sit on the front two bolts and act as a shelf. Three holes are then drilled in the larger plexi sheet, and it is then fixed onto the top of the bolts with screws and washers. A small hole is then drilled into which the laser lens is carefully placed. 
Finally, the phone is carefully positioned on top of the laser lens. But we need a specimen. What is at hand? I know, a human hair. This is put on a specimen tray. And the tray placed between the two layers of plexiglass. It is then carefully adjusted for focus. And hey presto, with the LED light illuminating the subject, the beauty of the human hair can be seen in all its cellular glory on your, well, cell phone. So point proved, the CMOS sensor inside your phone can easily be unleashed as an amazing microscope. The digital camera, truly a wicked invention. For centuries, battles have produced some pretty grisly injuries. Just a peek at any record of conflict, from the ancient Greeks to the Bayer Tapestry to the modern conflicts in the Middle East today, will show limbs ripped off by axe or artillery. Modern composite materials mean a veteran isn't consigned to dragging themselves about on a set of stumps, unlike their unfortunate medieval forebears. However, replacing a lost limb with a metal or wood attachment isn't as new as you might think. Even as early as ancient Egypt, a body has been found which is fitted with a wooden toe. It was found that, that it belonged to a noble woman. With it being the great toe, I suppose it would have given her some stability to walk, but perhaps also it would have been something that would be of cosmetic use to her. Roman historian Pliny the Elder tells us of hard as nails Roman general Marcus Sergius, who having lost his hand in battle, had an iron one fitted so he could still carry his shield. By the 1550s, German craftsmen were creating metal hands to strap over the stump of injured noblemen. And as the centuries went on, more and more artificial limb makers developed techniques that are still the foundation upon which artificial limbs stand or fall. The biggest advancement to prosthesis would, however, come as a result of World War I. It's one of those unfortunate things that the advances in prosthetic limbs has advanced to such a degree because of warfare. 100 years ago, you were lucky to be able to stumble along. Nowadays, you can recover your life. Thousands of injured men were given their second chance via a fitted aluminium leg. And veterans from more recent conflicts like Iraq and Afghanistan are wearing the next generation still. The amazing technological advances in prosthesis are encapsulated by the sea leg. The sea leg is the most researched micropressor controlled knee joint in the world. It has been on the market for almost 20 years and has become the best-selling mechatronic knee joint in every country to solve. Established in the aftermath of World War I and now manufacturing up to 5,000 sea legs a year, Otto Bock Healthcare Products continue to produce these life-altering prosthetics and supply them to those in need. Walking is, and should be, an automatic function. In a biological leg, Nerves acting as sensors send signals to the leg muscles that then move accordingly. This happens up to 20 times every second in what is known as a reflex loop. In the sea leg, the microprocessors replace the body sensors, whilst the hydraulics replace the muscle function. The production of a sea leg is a combination of in depth research of natural walking gait, precision manufacturing of the casing, and hydraulics. The hydraulic system of the knee joint is filled with air free oil in a special vacuum filling device. This technology guarantees that bound air in the form of the bubbles is removed from the oil. However, what makes the sea leg so intuitive is the all important microprocessor that acts as the brains of the leg, controlling the hydraulics via sensors that are vital to the gate control. The microprocessor sits at the top of the ceiling, just below the knee joint, inside this electronic cover. It is assembled using an automated pick and place machine. It is then fixed into the main electronic cover, along with battery contacts, sensor and the vibration unit that alerts the user to any mode changes in the leg. The electronics are then checked before being glued to the casing. It is now time to assemble the hydraulic unit. This unit controls the ceiling's valve position and the damping to the extension and flexion of the knee joint by regulating valves for oil flow. Magnetic sensors are inserted into the holder and soldered. The servo electronics are then inserted into the case and the plugs are soldered and secured. The engine unit of the ceiling 
is then positioned before being tested and adjusted accordingly before being glued into the case. Due to its worldwide use, it is important that the sea leg can function in a wide variety of climates. To achieve this, up to 100 pieces are tested each week by first putting the main electronics, server electronics and beeper into a test board and then analysed in the test programme. The test record is then filled in before the boards are put into a climate cabinet that ranges from minus 15 degrees centigrade to 65 degrees centigrade, as well as being tested at a humidity level of 85%. The assembly process of the sea leg continues with the checking of the leg's coated frames for any marks or damage. Damper is glued into the frame of the leg in order to prevent the various components within from moving and clashing against the frame whilst the leg is used. The serial numbers of every component that makes up the C-Leg are then recorded to ensure accuracy and clarity as they are tested. The battery of the C-Leg is added as well as a sliding component that is used to measure the knee angle. The beeper that will serve to alert patients along with the vibration unit is then inserted and connected to the main electronics. Once this has been done, the measuring function of the angle sensor of the C-Leg is verified. The knee angle sensor is used during usage of the leg as a way of measuring the knee position and controlling the prosthesis. The joint is turned on and connected to PC software and then bent and stretched from 1 to 7 degrees and then tested. The results are recorded and if all tests are passed, the hydraulics can then be built into the sea leg. You always need an interdisciplinary team. You need uh, engineers of all kinds of professions. You need a lot of people in testing. You need uh, clinical experts. You, uh, so it's really a big clinical team which has worked together for, for a good result in this field. Each sea leg has its own testing protocol according to each patient's specific needs. The final testing process begins with connecting the joint to a computer and then manually bending and stretching the joint. The sea leg is then mounted onto a walking simulator. Here, 1,000 steps are simulated for a period of 20 minutes. Now that the sea leg has undergone the rigorous and thorough testing process and passed, it is then packaged along with the instruction manual for the patients and shipped, ready for use. Every employee assembles up to 25 sea legs per week that are sent out worldwide to patients that will now be able to feel more stable and, most importantly, comfortable in their everyday mobility. In my opinion, the sea leg hasn't changed my life because I can do with the sea leg everything I did before. I can go motorcycle riding, I can go bicycling, I can go skiing, I can do everything I want. Using state-of-the-art materials and research that can improve the lives of those that need them, it's safe to say that this sea leg is the epitome of a wicked invention. So there you have it. A dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. The wristwatch, the digital camera and the prosthetic leg. All wicked inventions. Thank you.